Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Ranger Rob Country Living Podcast. I want to welcome you to the show. Uh, it's a fairly new podcast and a fairly uh, new live show that we're doing. And uh, so, yeah, we're still growing. So we'll be uh, happy just to get a, ha- a handful of people to stop in. Uh, we tend to get more viewers after the show. One of the things we also uh, realized is sometimes when people are watching the show, on Facebook and they make comments, sometimes we don't see it on the software that we're using. And that's not your fault. Um, But uh, it seemed to be working okay last week. But if you really want to get in the chat or ask any questions or make suggestions or anything, um, hey, Dale, um, make sure to go to the YouTube version. And we seem to see those with no problem. So like Dale's on YouTube and uh, we just saw his comment come in. So, hey, all's good in the world. Oh, where are you from, Dale? Uh, so today I want to also remind you that the Ranger Rob Country Living Podcast can be found uh, in an audio version. This is um, audio version, but you can see me in the studio doing the show. Um, we stream while well, we run our uh, podcast off of Spreaker, and then we're in several. Uh, oh, CRR. <laughs> hey, Dale. <laughs> I think I was talking to you the other day in some, oh, I saw your comment the other day in one of the videos we did. Anyway, uh, you can find us on Spreaker and uh, several other uh, platforms, including the new uh, Amazon um, podcast version. So if you went to your Echo and actually said, let's see if I can get my, my Alexa not to go off, but you just say, Alexa, play Ranger Rob Country Living Podcast, and uh, it will find it. <laughs> so it's really cool. Um so yeah, we uh, our podcast is on several platforms, um, and one of the best um, um, pieces of software I use on my cell phone is called uh, Podcast Addict. And not only could you get our podcasts on there, but several others. So podcasts are just great. You know, um, you've got a cell phone, put an earphone on it, go to work in the backyard. You know, do your thing, listen to your favorite podcast, and hopefully one of them will be Ranger Rob Country Living Podcast. So. Uh, CRR, boy, I could do a show just about CRR, but <laughs> I'd be in trouble. I'd probably have people knocking on my door. But uh, uh, one of the things I've been kind of doing videos in our area about is our concern about losing people that are volunteers to our fire department um, just because they didn't get the jab in the arm. And uh, I keep telling people if I'm a having a heart attack or I had a car accident on the area that we lived in. And CRR, by the way, stands for uh, um, Crooked River Ranch. (laughs) I I hope you're saying that uh, Crooked River Ranch is the part that's boring and not me. (laughs) But anyway, um, um, yeah, if I was in an accident, the last thing I'd be worried about is whether someone got the job or not. It's like, uh, uh, yeah. And, uh, I can't talk too much about that because YouTube's kind of cracking down on that subject, unfortunately. And so, uh, but I do have a lot of things I'll be talking about here. Let me turn my notes over here. And uh, hydroponics is one of them. So for those of you who watch our channel a lot, you know that we have four types of uh, hydroponics. We have what's called, um, the we call them strawberry towers, where... Uh, Oh, cool. So Dale's telling us uh, on CRR, uh, he doesn't know the information about our area, but the Redmond District, which is a town uh, about 20 miles from us, is um, finding ways to uh, work it out with people that don't have the job. And that's great. I mean, anyway, maybe they have to wear masks more. Maybe they have to be tested once a week. But I I know there's a compromise in there, and that's the big thing is compromise. So uh, anyway, getting back to hydroponics, we have uh, the you know the uh, strawberry towers that you see that the hydroponics uh, go into the top of the tower, go through the tower, and into the ground, and uh, doesn't hurt a thing. It's just nutrients, um, and that one does not return the nutrients, so it's a one-way street. Then we have what's called NFT, which is a nutrient film technique, which is just pipes. So it's like a full-time river, and. Uh, <laughs> Then we also have uh, Dutch buckets and we have floating rafts. And we're just introduced to a new type. Hey, Chris. Um, 
Brunswick, Canada. I have some relatives up there. Um, so uh, uh, I just, I was watching Who Chose, which is a uh, uh, he kind of specializes in the experimental and idea um, of different types of hydroponics, and um, he's uh, doing a new one where it's kind of like you create a tank and you just have to use two by fours. It has it doesn't have to be very deep, and uh, basically you put fabric. Uh, pots like what you would grow potatoes in or something like that in this little maybe four to five inch high little tank and you just put your um, growing bags in there and then uh, you um, put nutrients into the the tank which is only going to be an inch high or so and then fill the rest in with just pebbles and rocks and uh, literally um, uh, use a gravity fed you don't even need a pump a gravity fed uh, tank to keep that tank full, which is only an inch so, and an uh, inch of uh, nutrients in it, and it wicks into the fabric bags, which in turn gives you the nutrients to your plants. Which the plant uh, you don't need to use dirt; you want to use coconut core and perlite. And uh, anyway, uh, I think I'm going to try that technique next year. Um, where I have my trellises and my NFT. I'm taking the NFTs out of there because I keep growing things in there. I have, <laughs> they create these giant roots and eventually they get so big, they clog up the, the uh, NFT system and then it overflows and then it empties out my tank. And uh, uh, it can be kind of a pain because you, if you're not careful, you can kill the plant if you're cutting the, the roots back. But I mean, if you cut the roots back right, you won't kill the plant, but it's really a pain. And uh, I don't like the fact that my tank's running empty when I'm not paying attention and then uh, taking the risk of burning out the, the pumps in there. So that's a new kind of hydroponics we're looking into. And in the NFT that we do now, we want to bring indoors or into a greenhouse. So we may be building another greenhouse in the future. So you can watch our channel as we go about that. Now, we built our own uh, from scratch uh, last year. And uh, we love it so much that we either may build another one, which is actually much more cost effective to build one yourself than to get even buy the kits. But we'll see. Uh, if we buy a kit, we may go to um, Growing Solutions and get one of their 24 by 24 kits and then do the rest you know, uh, by hand. So we'll see. Um, but yeah, that's what's going on with hy uh, hydroponics. Uh, of course, we're getting into fall. And good old fall is starting to kill my plants. <laughs> like my outdoor tomatoes, they're pretty much saying we're done. Um, my peppers survived the first. We had our first frost this morning. And uh, the peppers seem to have survived it. Good for them. And so, uh, yeah, we're kind of winding down on the growing stuff. But um, I've got so much more to talk about in homesteading that I won't spend a lot of time on hydroponics or, or growing. Um and I want to start off as I was watching a seminar from uh, Joel. Oh, I just went blank. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll, he's a, a very um, prominent person who's in the permaculture. And I'll think of his name uh, right in the middle as I know it. But anyway, he was doing a seminar about what, what are homesteaders. Now, I've defined homesteaders as... Uh, uh, People that want to be more self-sufficient, but it's a lot more than that. It's people that care about their own food uh, or have a, a homestead. It also can be defined as a stronger family base, um, uh, appreciation for food, animals, and the land. And uh, permaculture is really what that's all about. For example, with us, uh, what we try, we don't, you know, depending on the diversification of the different animals you have, um, you can really do things for your soil. Here in Central Oregon, our soil sucks, and so we have to amend it all the time. However, you could, over time, let your animals actually help uh, bring the quality up of your soil. Um, now, for example, for us, our chickens, everything we do with our chickens, uh, anything they when we're cleaning and stuff, we have a compost bin. We try to use all um, all their droppings and stuff to actually help create more soil to add to ours to amend it. But you know, you can actually start. You know, if you like, don't mind clipping the wings of your chickens. 
uh, you know, let your chickens come into the, uh, when you're done with, like right now, when we're finishing up on our garden, this is the time to let the chickens come in there and kind of clean it out and, and eat what, you know, well, all the leftover plants and stuff that are dying out and let them uh, poop and scratch and, and get all that dirt all mixed together. Um, the same thing is if uh, people that have cows or, or pigs or uh, sheep, um, uh, goats, they all, uh, hey, Jace, good to see you. Um, they'll bring their animals and rotate them into the growing areas or their, or their fields to help amend their soil <coughs> and actually bring the quality up. And that's the kind of farming I wish everybody would do because uh, the big time farmers, you know, they're not doing that with amending their soils and stuff. It's all about chemicals with them. And uh, I'm going to straighten my screen out here a little bit. Um, but anyway, so uh, as we get different animals on here, the more that we're going to do more permaculture to try to increase the quality of the dirt that we're using for growing. Um, and yes, uh, Jace, I will tell him that we are in, <laughs> we are in TikTok. I don't know how he, uh, Jace actually talked me into going into TikTok. Uh, I'm just not funny enough, <laughs> but, um, I've got some stuff up there. It's doing okay, but, uh, uh, I'll, I'll be, I won't be anybody going viral on TikTok for sure, but uh, it's been kind of fun, something different and trying to accept the new times of new kinds of advertising and getting our business. Uh, you know, the uh, our poopy bags, uh, the Ranger Rob poopy bags, our sales seem to be a little higher, but we're also doing some advertising with another uh, couple of channels um, that have been helping us out too. So anyway, sales for Ranger Rob poopy bags have been great. And yes, Jason, I will get some to you. Uh, you have to send me your address again in Facebook messaging. Yum. By the way, I got one of those new Keurigs. I'm not totally redneck. Um, the ones that have multiple um, streams in it. And because uh, I always noticed, because I used to take the, the coffee grounds out of my little cups um, <laughs> and uh, try to save it. And uh, I always noticed that the, grounds inside those cups uh, don't seem like they're like totally getting saturated. And so when they came out with the new multi-stream Keurigs, I finally got one because my other one was kind of dying out anyway. And I'm pretty impressed with it. The only problem is, is um, it can make a little stronger coffee if you're not used to it. And I like strong coffee. So, so yum, super yum. So homesteads, um, First of all, it don't have to be 5 billion acres. It doesn't have to be 10 acres. It doesn't have to be five like ours. It could be an acre, maybe three quarters of an acre. Um, and then there's places I would call that even have regular lots that I wouldn't, you know, I easily would call them a homestead because they can easily take what they got and turn and, and utilizing the space in their property and everything could actually, um, uh, could actually produce enough food to actually feed your family quite a bit. Uh, let me see what Dale was saying here. Dale will say, one of the local organic farmers look, uh, locally runs a herd of hogs in a lot and goes back with uh, the cereal greens and gets an excellent um, tilth in crop. Yes. Uh, rotates them over several of these smaller area plots. Yes, exactly. And that is exactly a great example of permaculture. Um, and that's, we can do it in a small scale too. I mean, if you just have chickens, great. Now we're kind of limited to what kind of critters we can have here in the Cricket River Ranch area. Even though I have five acres, I would love to have a cow, maybe two. I've got the room, you know, I got the space. My five acres is totally clear for doing that, but not allowed. I think you have, a, have to have 10 acres or more. And we're not allowed to have pigs either. And I would love to get Idaho pasture pigs. They don't like to dig. <laughs> and so um, I would think that it would be really nice to be able to uh, talk uh, to the folks down in the Crooked River Ranch area where we live and say, hey, uh, I know you guys don't want us to have pigs or anything, but the Idaho pasture pigs are not a digging pig. And, uh, you know, I don't care if they just limited us to two per five acres or something like that. That would be awesome. Um I mean, a little compromise would be great. Um, and uh, uh, I mean, because 
it's kind of funny. You can't have a cow here, but people have horses, and they'll put more than one horse uh, per acre. And uh, I don't know, I'd just like to see a couple more um, compromises in that area from where we live. But I can't complain. I can at least do a few things that I certainly couldn't do in the city. So, uh, you yeah, know, we make do. Uh, Dale was saying uh, you can have pigs on the ranch uh, have to be 50 feet from your property lines. Is that true? Is that? I have never heard that. I, I, oh, my gosh. If that's true, this place is going to get some Idaho pasture pigs. <laughs> Guaranteed. Uh, I've been watching a couple of channels now that have the Idaho's, <clears throat> and they're amazing. They don't like to dig. They just, uh, they're not tearing up the ground like all the other pigs do. And they're very, very friendly, too. So that's a good deal. I'll have to check in on that, Dale. Thank you very much. Um, let's see where we're at here. So um, I was talking with, you know, with homesteading and all that stuff, is uh, one of the things that this uh, Joel Sullivan, that's his name, <laughs> was talking about, is the quality of, of teaching our kids how to work and how to deal with time. And a lot of uh, times, uh, I'll get I'll get that in a minute, Dale. Um, a lot of times, our kids are you know they're sitting on video games, they're bored, they don't know what they do with themselves. And if you got a homestead that you're growing things that have critters and stuff, your kids don't have that much time anymore to do that kind of stuff. And what they're actually learning is skills. Um, you know, uh, uh, Joel in, in his. Um, presentation was talking to some eighth graders and stuff and he asked all the kids uh how many knew how um what plants can you grow in the winter and maybe a handful of kids well maybe one or two actually listed off a, a few and and they said well, let's make it this easier what do you know you know uh, uh, about what you can plant in the summer and the kids would tell them a couple of plants and they did all right but it was just a few out of a lot <laughs> they didn't have a clue they're all just dumbfounded and then he says, like, um, how many uh, know about the cadastrian? <laughs> you know, some famous people on, on the Internet, and they all raised their hand. And then the last question he asked him says, which one do you think is more important to survive with? Um, and, of course, all of them were silent. But uh, one of the things we teach our kids when they're homesteading is chores and things, uh, relationships with the, uh, the food, relationships of where food comes from. Uh, there's always, there's never a time on a homestead where there's nothing to do. Uh, Dale was saying, by the way, uh, there are there are cows on over four on shad. I've seen that, <laughs> and about five cows on uh, drove. Check the CRR. People do it anyway. <laughs> Maybe I should do that. Just do it until I'm caught, huh? Uh, yeah, I've seen just down the road from my uh, I'm at, I'm on Deer Road. Um, if I go down uh, a little farther, I, I, there's a guy with cows in there. I was like, how's it? Maybe he owns two lots or something. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I was here 20 years ago and they may have made some changes. And so apparently Dale, I need to do some homework because I've been kind of going by things I knew about 20 years ago. And then I came back here in the last two years. So, uh, Dale, thank you very much. Um, and uh, yeah, I know some of you from the outside that probably hear us talking about shad and all these things. This is kind of like CRR secret code. Um, it's the area we live in. And uh, um, so we're just referring to some roads and different things. Uh, Crooked River Ranch is a very large, large uh, area, which has uh, up, I believe, four to 5,000 people living on it. Um, and, but everybody has acreage. And so uh, started out as recreational properties and stuff, and then eventually people said, oh, "I want to build a house." And pretty soon things changed, and now it's just houses, and you can't have RVs. Um, they were saying that the, there was a man of about there was oh, let me see this bring it up on the screen here. There was a herd of about twelve on quail, and they are down to about five now, bull and cow feeders. They must have more than five acres, I think. But, um, and yes, and Dale's, <laughs> Dale's obviously 
has been more informed on on things than I am. So we got 12,000 acres here on CRR or Creek River Ranch, and there's about 4,800 people. I was close, kind of. All right. <laughs> I used to be, guys, um, at my age, uh, you'll find a lot of people my age that we volunteered for all kinds of things. Now, 20 years ago when I was here before, I was actually on what they called the Crooked River Ranch Chamber of Commerce. And I was involved in a whole bunch of things. I owned a business that helped everybody do websites and stuff. And uh, so I was up to my nose in politics and all that kind of stuff. And so, uh, and yeah, and so, uh, which, you know, just keeps you on edge all the time. And somebody's always fighting with someone else. And so when I got back, I have not volunteered for anything and uh, kind of avoided some of the stuff. Um, of course, you know, I, I, I do the Ranger Rob Country Living stuff. And so I, I do uh, uh, pick up a lot of folks from CRR. And, and so I got a voice sometimes that way. Um, yeah. And Dale was saying, and this, this is very true. And this isn't just true in our area, but... Um, uh, people routinely uh, cram too many animals in they, uh, than they should. I think the CRO is a very large animal, uh, is one large animal per acre. Uh, but the horse hoarders go way over that. And that's very, very true. Um, I have a hard time. Like horses are great and horses are beautiful. And, and I enjoy the time with them. And I do like to ride and stuff, but all in all, if you if they're not doing anything other than that, to me, I like an animal that's productive. <laughs> I, I I know that's probably a wrong word to say for people that love horses. I love I love horses. I could see why you could love horses, but I just like okay, I do all that work and maintain and the money and all those things. What do I get back other than love and, and appreciation for horses and writing? If you go writing and stuff, I could understand that. But to me, I don't see how productive they would be for me and Sherry. Um, a cow, productive. Um, uh, I can't even really tell you that I'm really interested in goats or, or sheep or anything like that. Yeah, I know you can eat them and all that stuff, but uh, I want something a little substance. Give me a cow and a pig. That's it. That's all I want. I'd be a happy camper. Ah, but anyway, the quality of life of homesteading. Um, I think if we wanted to recover our kids and get our kids even healthier, get them in the dirt, get them working, get them slimy, get them cleaning out horse stalls or, or chicken manure and, and get them exposed to to the world and nature, and you'll find your kids are probably going to be healthier. Don't get sick as often. Uh, can shake a cold super. You won't worry about this COVID stuff and all that stuff because um, the kids are going to be strong and going to have good immunity and stuff and, and get them rolling in the dirt again. And uh, uh, and on a homestead, it would be so funny to see the kids transform from they've got to have the latest video game to the clever little things and trouble they can get into on your property. And, uh, you know, the things you just never think of, he's got some pipe or something or a tire or something in the yard that you never paid attention to. And they've turned it into a toy and, or roll themselves down a hill or something in it. And, um, and, uh, maybe break an arm, <laughs> you know, all those healthy things, <laughs> but, and then they get filthy and, uh, all that kind of stuff. And it's like, you can't ask for a better thing for kids. Um, uh, the, the time, I mean, the research time I'm hearing of adults and kids sitting in front of television or video games when they could be out being productive, create, making food and taking care of animals, making their own food quality, you know, know what the quality of their food is. And also maybe uh, uh, being more self-sufficient, um, not only growing food and growing uh, and, and, uh, making food, but also preserving food and whole works. And so really that's what this channel is all about. Like uh, last year is when we got fired up because, um, you know, we had to build a bunch of stuff when we got here. Uh, this property was designed for flowers and, and grass, and we converted it to uh, not only flowers and grass because we still do caregiving for Sherry's mother. So we try to keep those things in here so 
she enjoys coming over and seeing the flowers and things like that. And so we keep that going, but she really is amazed at what we've done with vegetables and especially hydroponics. And so uh, this has been our first year cycle to see how well, like the new green, you know, the greenhouse was, will it be good or not? And we're like, I don't know how we ever went through the world without a greenhouse. Um, and, and then when we're getting ready to amend all this soil and stuff, and we started bringing truckloads of stuff in to try to till the grounds and stuff. It was, you know, a lot of money. And that's right in the middle of that. So when we got exposed to hydroponics, I'm going, well, hey, let's, let's do this instead. This is much more practical, uses less water, don't have to buy all the amendments for the soil. And it was amazing. And then when we combined hydroponics with our greenhouse, oh my gosh. Well, we're not perfect at, at it the first year because, you know, uh, we came up from Phoenix. I've lived here before, but we were down in Phoenix two years ago. And uh, we never thought we'd be back up here. But it was Sherry's father's death and all that stuff. And we wanted to get her mother back up here with her friends and, and back in the area. And she made us an offer to say, hey, why don't you buy the house? And it's like, okay, here we are again. <laughs> I was planning on being a city slicker. But uh, anyway, but I was doing uh, gardening the whole works right in Phoenix, which was an amazing place to grow stuff, by the way. Um, and uh, anyway, so here we are. Um, so moving right along, I wanted to talk about um, the homestead life about kids. Um the other thing is, it's amazing what's going on with food. Um, the regulations and the, and the things that they're doing to our food, um, even in in the meat packing and, and, and produce area, the things that they're spraying and doing on our food, you just won't, you, because the governments come in and say, oh, you got to worry about this and worry about that. And the best thing that you, Joe Sullivan, uh, Sullivan's been saying is, uh, be your own quality control, raise your own food. Um, and so next year we are doing meat birds. And so, uh, I'm looking forward to that, um, to build the cages and feed them and stuff. I'm actually my least worry for cost. Um, I, I, I don't have any problem building that stuff. I've done that before, but the processing is the one that's going to be a little costly because I want to do it right. Um, so I, I'm going to invest on, uh, a, a cover and then also automatic plucker, uh, good cutting equipment, the whole works. So the process is done very clean, very precise. Uh, one time I have some friends over, send them home with some free chicken. Um, and, uh, and then I also have to buy another freezer because um, I've done shows where I've shown you what we do with our freezers. We have three of them. One we uh, keep for just chicken, one we keep for just meat, and another one for a variety of things in our pork. But if I do freezer chickens, <laughs> I do 50 to 25 chickens, uh, I don't have the space, so i got to bring another uh, freezer in. So so I got that. So I got it's the equipment for st storage and processing that I fear is going to be the most expensive um, uh, cause the chickens by, you know, only take eight, eight weeks to grow the full size. And to me, that's amazing. Um, you know, $5, uh, five pounds of bird after they're cleaned out, you know, uh, you know, you're looking at 125 pounds of meat, um, and above. And, uh, that's amazing in such a short amount of time. So, uh, that is definitely, uh, something and we enjoy, we do a lot of cooking with chicken, although you see uh, meat wise, since I maybe I can't have a cow, but um, <laughs> I'm not going to check into that. Um, but, uh, you know, I order our meat directly from uh, grass fed uh, farms that will ship it to us. So I use like Butcher Box and a couple other uh, facilities. We also have one here in Sisters called Sister Cattle. Sisters Cattle Company, where you can actually buy into a quarter, a half, or a whole beef. And uh, um, so I'm not having any trouble getting the beef I want. I don't know what kind of problems I might have with the way today's uh, society is going and things are changing so much. Um, and, uh, oh, by the way, Dale was saying horses are nothing but cash-eating monsters. <laughs> I was a cowboy and had them over, over the years. So uh, my concept of horses 
seems to be correct. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you, Dale. <laughs> um, anyway, so um, one of the things we're trying to show on this channel is, is lead by example. So we came here, uh, we knew we liked homesteading. We knew we wanted to be more self-sufficient, but now we've got the five acres. Uh, we could really ha you know, bring it up to a whole nother level. Well, this year we, sh we sure in heck did. And, and, uh, you know, we really crushed it on tomatoes. We really crushed it on a lot of things. And we found out what we could grow well and what we need to do better on. Like corn, we almost nailed it. But we need a corn uh, that's a little better for this region. Um, so we'll try it again, but we're going to do it a little different. Um, so not bad for the first year. We're pretty happy with it. So pat on the back for us. Um, but, it, you know, uh, you got to fail. You got to get in here and do this stuff and give it a shot. And um, there's nothing more I mean, satisfying. Like every night when we have dinner, um, we're eating a salad, and that whole salad is everything we grew. And I uh, just made uh, dinner tonight um, for Sherry had to go to, uh, uh, she's doing a, a woman's uh, church thing right now um, at our church. And uh, so she's at that. So I made a bok choy. Uh, well, it's more like a chicken soup, but I, I tried something new. I used ramen, um, but um, um, I'd be, it'd be cool if I could have used my own chicken. Um, and it, But I am using bok choy in it, and so I've never grown bok choy. So I've been trying bok choy in almost everything, <laughs> and I love it. And so, uh, uh, so yeah, I mean, we're learning so much, and and. and I just tell people who are younger than me, you have no excuse. You got a lot more energy than I do. And uh, uh, try. Uh, I don't care if you only have an acre. You can grow food. You can grow a couple of animals. You can have chickens easy. Um, and, and if you're worried about the noise, don't get a rooster. Um, just get a five, ten hens. I got ten Rhode Island Reds. And by the way, it reminds me, if you want to see what the chickens are doing, um, let me uh, stimulate their... Uh, camera here. There they are. The chicken cam. <laughs> <laughs> so we have 10 Rhode Island Reds. They're all hens. Uh, they're pumping out seven to 10 eggs every day. Oh my gosh, we've got so many eggs. But uh, the good thing is, is we um, um, uh, freeze dry them. So every week we take 48 eggs and we freeze dry them, turn them into powder put them in mylar bags, put an oxygen absorber in there and seal it up. And now we've got eggs and we got, we've been doing this for a year now almost. Uh, we got a lot of eggs, <laughs> but they're, they're good for 25 years. In fact, I think for Christmas, everybody's going to get a bag of eggs. <laughs> we, besides, there's going to be so many shortages out there. No one's going to be able to get anything at the store. So, hey, I can give out eggs. Uh, ours are powdered. So all is like super easy. Um, so, uh, yeah, the freeze dryer, oh my gosh, has been a lifesaver. Um, anything that we grew too much of the freeze dryer is saved our butts because, uh, basically, uh, when I have too many, uh, we even made tomato powder by the way to cook with, which is amazing stuff. Um, but, uh, we had a bunch of celery freeze dried, all that. Now I got them in jars. I just used freeze dried carrots and uh, celery in my soup today. I didn't have to cut them or nothing. I just had to rehydrate them, throw them in the soup and yum. It was so simple. And uh, and if you don't have a freeze dryer, you'd be amazed what you can do with just canning. Um, buy that extra quantity because right now, if you haven't seen what's going on, if you think things are looking a little bit suspicious right now, you just wait a couple more months. Uh, we're getting hammered. We're going to have a shortage on a lot of stuff, and we're going to be a lot of rationing going on. And uh, which means when I say rationing, it means like instead of you buying two of something, they'll say you can only have one. Um, uh, it's coming, and it's already showing signs that it's getting getting that way already. Right, we scoot me over a little bit. Uh, so anyway, uh, um, I keep getting off off my track here. So um, homesteading, the big thing I wanted to do is the quality of food, uh, making sure that you're getting, uh, you know, the light, 
you're more likely to get have problems with food that are being processed in a large scale than if you process that stuff yourself. I mean, um, the government didn't start stepping in with all of our food processing until, oh, from 50 to 80 years ago. So you have to ask yourself, for the thousands of years that I'm, uh, that humans have been around, how did we ever do it without government regulations? I just don't know. Um, so um, the reality the reality is, is you can be your own inspector, be your own advocate for good quality food. And uh, no, you don't need the government to be your little police department. And, uh, and then once again, I was saying with homesteading, you can't help but be diving into the dirt, getting filthy, even if I was doing fiber optics. Fiber optics. <laughs> okay. I used to be fiber optics. Um, doing hydroponics, um, we're getting filthy and dirty and the whole works. And uh, um, I very rarely get sick. Um, I'm getting older now. Maybe I'll be more susceptible to stuff. But I've really done for years. Um, I just... I just don't get sick that often, knock on wood. Um, and when I do, I get over it pretty quick. Um, um, I'll just take a few more supplements of vitamin C and things like that. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm back on my feet pretty quick. So, yeah, uh, I have to thank being a slob for that. <laughs> and the last thing I want to make sure with home um, homesteading is land management is we can all be a sample of what the future brings. And it's like land management um, with growing food and having animals can work together. It's called permaculture. And uh, the more people that exercise it, whether on a small scale or a larger scale, um, will send a signal out to uh, hopefully medium-sized farmers and, and bigger farmers that start saying, maybe we should change our ways. Maybe I should rotate my my animals into the places I grow when things are done and then, and keep the cycle moving and then letting other fields recover while the other ones are being worked on by the animals and it, and then bring different animals in for different purposes to, to clean out a, a, a perfectly good um, grazing field of grass, um, bring the animals in at different levels to, uh, uh, mix in the, the cow manure that's dropped down there and all that stuff's good stuff. Uh, it's not evil. Like, uh, like they say in, in Washington and, uh, and <laughs> get it mixed into our soil. Let the animals do the work. Uh, let them churn up the ground. Let them uh, uh, pull out the weeds. Let them uh, um, uh, get that soil really going well, get them off of it, let it recover and then keep moving your animals while your other parts are uh, recovering. And then the one before that is, is thriving and you can start rotating your animals into really healthy fields and you're renewing your soil every time. So uh, one of the things we're talking about in preserving is I've been telling you about the freeze dryer. Um, yes, a freeze dryer does cost a lot of money. There's no doubt. You're looking at um, $35,000 to $4,000. But I'm telling you, if you can save your money, and I think you can do um, a kind of a lease purchase kind of thing with, uh, um, uh, what are they called? Harvest? Harvest Right is the name of the company. You can actually make payments until you reach the, the, the amount, and then they'll send it to you. Um, I've heard of that. I don't know if you can. But if you really like to get one, I'm telling you, it's worth it. Um, the amazing things you can do with it. And then when you go to the farmer's market and you say, oh, look at all those green beans that look delicious, but I don't want to buy a whole case. Well, buy the whole case now. Put them in the freeze dryer. Seal them up in a Mylar bag, and they're good for 25 years. And they taste like day one when you reconstitute them. This is amazing. Um, so look at the money you could save, the quality of food you could have. And next time you go to a farmer's market and you say, gosh, look at all those uh Great looking tomatoes. You can freeze dry that stuff too, by the way. Um, or salary or a really good deal. And uh, uh, if you learn how to can too, you know, really, if you see a great deal on cucumbers and things like that, um, uh, nail it, buy it, save money, quantity, and get quality at the same time. And uh, 
this is a 60 year old guy talking to you guys. And I was like, come on, keep up with me. And you should, be, <laughs> you should be able to outdo me because I'm old. Right. So, uh, uh, you 30 year olds and 40 year olds and 50 year olds, man, you can just do twice as much as me and Sherry are doing. And, and uh, last year I had Sherry here helping with a lot of pro uh, pro projects, but she had to go back into the workforce because, uh, you know, good old health care. We got to have it somehow. So uh, it's a little slower going because I'm by myself, but uh, uh, I'm keeping up. And so uh, come on, guys, keep up with me at least. And outdo me. Uh, I would really like to see you outdo me. Um, no problem. You can, I am, I'll be humble anytime when it comes to someone saying, hey, I'm growing more food than you. I'm growing more of this. I'm doing this better. Cool. And then you can show me. And then maybe I can talk to you and you come over and help with me. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, um, learn how to can. If you've never canned before, um, there's no excuse. YouTube is your friend when it comes to that kind of stuff. And uh, start learning how to do it. You don't have to start with the pressure thing. You can start with just the uh, hot water bath stuff. And and just buy a handful, you know, a whole bunch of cucumbers and make your first pickles. And there's different versions of that. You can do one that you don't have to can um, and just do a temporary thing. Or you can can them, um, try different recipes, and actually learn how to do this stuff. It's not hard. I'm a leave it the beaver family dad kind of thing. And so I'm now cooking. I'm now canning with my wife. I'm uh, getting preparing food and stuff. It's really not that hard. I mean, it's hard. I mean, it takes time. It's always a lot nicer if I'm helping my wife. It makes it a lot easier. So, no, I don't dump all this on my wife. Um, uh, everybody needs to get involved when you're doing harvesting and canning and freeze drying. Um, and in a lot of cases, if you see a really good deal on noodles at the store, or Costco's got a hot deal on uh, you know, this giant package of a whole bunch of spaghetti, you, you feel like you'll never eat it in a hundred years, buy it, separate it, put it in Mylar bags, seal it, put an oxygen absorber in it, then seal it, and uh, it's good forever, forever. So um, anyway, so the next one of the things I want to pass on to is trying to get people the incentive to maybe start thinking about homesteading, whether they just have a little place or a bigger place. But if you got pets, oh my gosh, this is the place to go. Um, so I want to talk about the German Shepherd I got. So I am so lucky because I bought our German Shepherd puppy when we lived in Phoenix. We had a standard small lot property, uh, just like everybody in the Mesa, Arizona area. I was growing food. We have a swimming pool, the whole thing. And Cinder, our older dog, she was older anyway, she loved it because she'd get her exercise playing in the pool. And uh, the super hot temperatures, um, she did all right. Um, she likes cooler temperatures, but she was all right. Cinder would have been fine. But if I would have stayed in Phoenix with that new puppy, and I don't know what I was thinking. I had no idea we were moving here. Um, I don't know what she'd do because she, first of all, if you're going to get a German Shepherd, they have energy. Oh, my gosh. They need to run. They need to play. They need uh, stimulus. Uh, otherwise, you're going to have a monster in your house. And uh, I didn't even realize, really, when we bought this place, and we brought her up here at six months old by the time we had her. And uh, this has been a blessing for a dog like that. So if you really want some a cool dog, uh, whether it's a German Shepherd or maybe a St. Bernard or uh, some energy dog like um, oh, uh, some of those other kinds of uh, herding dogs, um, you got to give them some room. They need room and they need to be, a, and you need to fence your property. And uh, you got to, you know, you got to, it's a two way street. You've got to be responsible for a dog like that. But the relationship you could have with a really special dog like that or a German Shepherd can be amazing if you have the right facilities and resources for them. And this property, with it fully fenced, has been the greatest thing for Belle, our, our German Shepherd. And I don't know how well she would have done. And also, she doesn't do that well in hot temperatures. Um, that fur of hers is something else. And uh, um, anyway, 
uh, I'm so glad that uh, she doesn't like water. She doesn't swim like Cinder. So uh, she probably would have been a, a very sad dog living in Phoenix. And uh, uh, so anyway, if you're going to get some property and stuff, hey, the doors open up to maybe different kinds of animals you never had before because you got the resources and you got the property to do it with. So, uh, gosh, I don't know what I do. I love our German Shepherd. And uh, she's not mean, but when she's upset or barking at someone, German Shepherds sound very mean. Um, she never heard a fly, but that's all I want is someone's at my gate. Someone's trying to hang around our property. I want them to think twice before they want to come into our property with a dog that sounds like a German Shepherd. I can guarantee you she would not hurt anybody, and uh, but they don't know that, and that's what's important. And so uh, I've got myself a really good security dog. And by the way, German Shepherds have great hearing. Oh, my gosh. If you watch their ears, they're like radars. Um, it's amazing. And so I couldn't have had a, a, a good dog like that without giving them a facility and resources to be the kind of dog they should be. So uh, another kud you know, uh, kudos for homesteaders that have a low property and especially ones that would fence it off to protect their dogs. And so, um, so you, you know, your dog doesn't irritate anybody else. So um, one of the other things I wanted to talk about is uh, I talked about the meat chickens, the new systems. Um, Generator. So you guys, if you watched maybe a week and a half ago, we had a new bypass um, electrical um, installation on our main circuit breaker. So what it does is there's a little plate in there. And so you have to turn off the master switch to the whole house, the whole property. So the master switch shuts off everything, which once that's moved, this little plate will drop down and allows me to turn on a new master switch that goes to a plug outside of the house, which is a 50 amp plug. And that means I can now feed electricity into our house without sending electricity into the power lines the other way. And uh, which could actually seriously hurt somebody if they're working on the lines, because if they're working on the lines, they think they're dead and I'm sitting there generating electricity, um, not cool. So by law, you've got to have a bypass. So there's no way you can have the master on and, and have the generator pumping um, electricity into your house. Um, one or the other have to be on. And that's what this little plate does. So I've got that in. Well, now, uh, if you look even farther back in your videos, you can see we did a backup system for our well. So I bought a, um, a 5,000, a Champion 5,000 generator. Uh, it was a really good deal. I paid like $5.99 for it at a place called Coastal. Um, and we got a bypass put in into the well system. And it works perfect for generating enough power to run our well. Well, now I've got this new 50 amp. Now, by the way, that was a 30 amp system. Well, now... Uh, I can use that system. I can adapt a 30 into a 50 amp plug, but it will only, you know, I can only run a few systems. My highest priority in this house is to run in the wintertime the pellet stove, maybe a television or something, simple things. Um, and if it was going to be off for a while, my highest priority would be keeping the freezers running. Well, I have a little 2000. Um, generator, which I can easily power a couple of my um, my freezers separately. So that's cool. But um, now I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I've got this new generator. By the way, Dale, if you're looking for a generator, um, that's a 5,000 that'll probably knock off, you know, 100 off of it. So I'll sell it for 500. It's got an hour on it. <laughs> One hour. It's brand. <laughs> so, anyway, but I'm looking at a new... Um, uh, I don't know what it's called now. Um, door light or something. I don't know. Anyway, it's like a 1300 watt generator that not only um, puts out about you know 1300 watts, it will also uh, run off of propane. And so, uh, uh, which is even better because 
I do store a lot of fuel here. I, I store about 80 to 100 gallons of fuel during the winter in case my generators need it. Um, but uh, the store fuel, they, it could go bad on you, but I do add do additives to all of our tanks. Um, but I could throw a propane nut tank on it and run it off that too. And uh, so that's kind of cool. And, and I don't have to worry about fuel going bad in the propane. So now I'm kind of torn. Uh, of course, a generator like that's averaging about $1,400. And so my, my wife, you know, I just got done buying these generators. And now I'm telling my wife, well, you might want to get a bigger one. We can really run a lot more systems off of a generator like that for the house. And, and the house powers the shop, which in turn has some other freezers in there. Um, if I just limit what I send to the shop that I'm just running that stuff, uh, I can run with a generator like that, all my freezers, the refrigerator, the pellet stove, and a few simple systems in the house and be snug as a bug during power outages in the wintertime. And so, yeah, the big part is convincing the high command that I need to buy that generator and then you know, then it's kind of like an overkill on generators. I'll probably have to get rid of the 5,000. And uh, I don't think I'll have too much trouble if I just knock off a hundred bucks on it. Somebody will get a good deal on a good generator uh, if they're not planning the power of their whole house with it. So, no, I can't run our heating systems or, or uh, we have um, um, air conditioning and all that stuff in the house. That's a absolutely no way can I run that stuff. But as long as I have my pellet stove, I can still heat the house. And that's what my highest priority is. Keeping heat in the house, maybe keeping power on for Sherry's Aquarium so sure they don't get too cold. Simple little systems to run during power outages. And I could do that. I could do it with the two little generators I got now, but I have power cords running all over the place. But if I could get a 1300, plug it in in the 50 amp and run it into the house, I could run a lot of simple systems um, and be comfortable as all get out while watching TV. <laughs> so, and uh, I could still turn on our internet again and run computers. So uh, um, yeah, that'd be a really good deal. So there may be a, a large a larger <laughs> generator in our future uh, with the loss of, it's like, I know even I think uh, three generators is a little, a little much people. So uh, I'm getting kind of close to running out of time here. So I want to make sure I talk about a couple of things. Um, I have to be careful with this subject, which is our freedoms. And, and I don't, you know, I talk about a lot in my videos about, things that are going on that concerns us. I also think that anybody is a homesteader or self-reliant or a prepper needs to stay up on the news. Don't inundate yourself with it because it'll drive you nuts. But um, uh, gosh, like today they're announcing with YouTube is they're really going to crack down on anybody that's anti-V. And uh, uh, so some really prominent people that there is some good uh, arguments about that subject that, you know, that's pro and con, and that needs to stay out there. There's people that need to know that stuff. And so why this journalism has to be uh, controlled by government planning <laughs> <laughs> or control, you know, why can't they just tell the news and read articles that are coming out by prominent doctors from pro or con for that subject. I don't know why that's such a sin, but uh, it's getting worse and worse. It's basically we're looking at censorship getting worse and worse, and in today's announcements, even making it worse because you can't get the whole story. And uh, you need to know the, the pros and cons. And so anyway, and it's not just that subject too. And it's like, um, it's funny that the things they talk about with the new guy we have, um, if it's not proactive, uh, well, let me give you a good example. Amazon is telling, you know, there's people that make T-shirts that are funny about the prior president and are funny about the new one. And uh, in some cases, uh, some of those T-shirts against the pr new leader we have are being asked to be taken off Amazon, at the sellers. 
but they never bothered to do that with the guy before that. It's like, well, why is he more precious than the one before? We should be able to hackle or, or have fun with um, whoever our leaders are. Why is it that one side has different rules than the other side? And that's what's really driving, I think, all of us crazy. And why is it like you guys are hearing about the news of uh, uh, the generals being uh, in front of the Congress and some of the crazy things that took place in decision making, and yet they'll not be accountable for it. They'll be shunned and the whole thing, but I don't see anybody resigning and stuff. But if it was a different group, people would be inside out having a fit. Um, the hypocrisy is just crazy. So one of the things I'm really worried about is um, uh, what we're putting in our bodies, uh, food-wise, medical-wise, oh, medical or anything like that, um, that we have the freedom to choose. And we need to be, freedom and liberty means tolerance. It means tolerance for whether someone's pro or con for some of the things that we're having debates over and let them have those opinions and let them live their lives that way and find ways to compromise. And the same thing with our, you know, our food quality. And uh, uh, we're going to have trouble with travel here pretty soon with these regulations that um, we got to find ways to allow everybody to have an opportunity to still travel, go see their folks. And uh, uh, I can't even tell you how, how bad it's been with Sherry's mother at the nursing home right now. Not nursing home. She's in um, assisted living. And uh, for two days, it got cleared where we could actually go in and visit her in her room. And then someone else came up with something, and then they locked it all down again. So every time it gets opened up again, some little case comes up again, and then they lock it all down again. And it's like totally ridiculous. They've all had their V shots, the jab. Um, it's like, and if you talk to almost everybody that's in assisted living, uh, older folks, they just like, I don't care. Let my grandkids come in. Let my daughter come in. Let my son come in. Uh, they want company. They want people to see. They don't need to be locked into a room. Um, and they're willing to take the chances for it because nobody deserves to be alone. Being alone and uh, and lonely is a terrible, terrible thing. And so uh, we've got to compromise on a lot of things. And we got to quit um, this one-sided view of everything. Uh, this is good. Everything else is evil. And I'm not going to even listen to it. You know, talk to the hand thing. We got to stop that. Uh, we need to compromise and uh, understand everybody. And uh, um, a lot of things that we're trying to prevent, we're actually making worse when it comes to segregation and things like that. And uh, we don't need that. We need the diversity. We need to be uh, in inclusive in the whole works. And we can't do it with all these, uh, you can't do this, you can't do that. And uh, uh, dividing us is... Is, is not good. So anyway, guys, I got to wrap this show up. So I want to thank all of you so much for uh, uh, viewing a lot. Of, a lot of our viewers usually come in later. Um, this is a fairly new show, so I, I don't expect big uh, uh, turnouts for our, our chat. But as time goes on, uh, I'm sure it'll get better. So we're trying to shoot for Wednesdays, uh, trying six o'clock to see how that worked. And uh, we'll see, we'll let you know next week what we're going to do. So, guys, have a great day. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. And until next time, bye now. Thank you very much for watching our video. Please take the time to like, subscribe, and share our videos all over the whole wide world. Thanks.